Blessed is he that read it, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. Welcome to Word on the Street, where we bring you hot topics. Today we're going to go through this book called Ukraine, an Illustrated History. And in this book, we're going to go to the chapter regarding... Now, I made a video regarding the Khazars, which is chapter 4. But today, we're going to go into chapter 16, which is Tartars and Cossacks. Now, um, we're going to take a look of these particular tribe, tribe in Ukraine. And how does it line up to what's going on today? My next, um, the next video I'm going to do on this series will be regarding Galatia, which is the same Galatia found in the Bible. All right. All right. So we're going to go ahead and go get into the content. This force was Tatars and Cossacks be the 14th century, while Lithuanian and Polish rule was being established in central and western Ukrainian lands. The southern steppe region and the Crimea were undergoing political change. The Mongolo Tatar Golden Horde was weakened after 1357 by two decades of internal strife and then, in the 1390s, by the efforts of Tamerlane to rule the entire Mongol Empire. As a result, during the first half of the 15th century, two new Tatar Khanates were carved out of the Golden Horde's territory, the Crimean Khanate in the west and the Kazan Khanate in the north. Finally, in 1502 the Golden Horde itself ceased to exist and its heartland on the lower Volga River was transformed into the Astrakhan Khanate. The three Khanates were formidable military powers and each continued the Golden Horde's practice of demanding tribute from Muscovy. The Crimean Khanate, which had a direct impact on Ukrainian lands, was under the rule of the Jiri dynasty whose capitals were first at Krym, later renamed Eski Kirim. J. Subay Yukoi in Day Q. Copyright J. Y. Y. Bullet in Adu. 1 7. Equals Subyo I. Y. O. S. Chi. I. Bax. Yubwoho 4. Soy. L. Underscore. Today. Stir. I. I. K. R. Y. M. And from the 15th century at Bak Kazare slash Bosses Array. In contrast to the Golden Horde, the Crimean Tatar rulers were at times positively and at others negatively inclined toward Italianate, Genos, and Venetian control of the Crimean coastal regions. But it was the Ottoman conqueror of Constantinople, Sultan Mehmed II, R. 1451 to 1481, who was the decisive factor in Crimean affairs. Determined to make the Black Sea into an Ottoman lake, he managed in 1475 to remove permanently the Genos from the coastal area, which was placed directly under an Ottoman adminis. Tration. Symbolic of the Italianate decline was the change in place names. Mon Castro, today Bilharad Dinastrovs KYI, became Turkish Akerman slash AQ Kerman, Tana, today Azov, became Azak, and Kaffa, today Feodosia, the most important Crimean port city became Kiev. Under Ottoman rule Kiev's port was expanded and its population increased to such an extent that by the early 17th century it was one of the largest sites in Eastern Europe. The Ottomans eventually recognized the Jiri dynasty, and although the Crimean Khanate was formerly a vassal state, it remained only loosely subordinate to the Ottoman Empire and effectively functioned as an independent state. The Crimean Khanate included not only the Crimean Peninsula, subdivided into two distinct parts the lowland SRRRNS, Tatars and Cossacks 83 No. 1 SS, EEIAP Arsriz Ritaidu, 16.2 battle between the Ottoman Turks and Crimean Tatars for control of Kaffa slash Kiev, from an Ottoman manuscript, 1586. Steppe and the mountains along the southern coast, but also the steppe lands beyond the Perico Isthmus that stretch from the mouth of the Dnieper River eastward all around the shores of the Sea of Azov to the Kuban region. This vast, sparsely settled territory was basically divided into two regions, the peninsula, including its steppe lands, and the steppe lands farther north. The sedentary Jiri rulers based in Bak Khazare and the Tatar tribal clans allied with them controlled most of the Crimean peninsula. As for the steppe lands farther north of the peninsula, 
they were after the mid-16th century the domain of nomadic Nogai tribes, originally from the lower Volga Valley, who were nominally subordinate to but more often independent of Crimean authority. These various Nogai tribes, Kuban, Yetikul, Yamboiluk, Yedison, Bagak, supplied the greatest number of Tatars most directly involved in Ukrainian lands. Despite their tenuous and often problematic relationship with the Crimean Khanate, the Nogais fulfilled for that state a quite useful purpose. Their presence prevented the establishment of Slavic settlements in the steppe and they provided the Crimean and Ottoman markets with a steady supply of its most important commodity slaves. Captured slaves from Ukrainian lands functioned at all levels of Ottoman society, from agricultural workers and house servants to galley slaves and soldiers in the imperial army and navy, advisors, and government officials, and in the case of women as prized members of the harems of wealthy nobles and the imperial court. Among the best known captives destined for the imperial harem was Nastya Lasovska, the daughter of a priest in Rahadin, far western Ukraine, who was abducted in 1520. As the legendary Roxolana, she became the only wife and political consultant of Sultan Stilamanite, the Magnificent, R1520-1556. In short, the Crimean export trade, and therefore its economic well-being, was based primarily on the slave trade. The Crimean rulers and merchants acted as middlemen, processing the slaves that they bought from the Nogai and Tatar raiders and then reselling them to buyers from the Ottoman Empire. The main source for the Nogai slave trade were Slavs captured mostly north of the open steppe in central and western Ukraine. Beginning in the 1470s and continuing to the end of the 17th century, the Nogai Tatars undertook annual slave raids along fixed routes that brought them to the southern Kiev, Brat, Slav, Podolaya, and Galicia Palatinates. Because of the Nogai and Tatar danger, the southern frontier regions of Ukraine became a kind of no man's land. These were the proverbial wild fields, Jiki Pol, in contemporary Polish writings, which separated Poland-Lithuania from the Crimean Khanate. The wild fields were at the same time a naturally rich and fertile region teeming, as contemporary documents recall, with cattle, wild animals, and fish. Consequently, as early as the 15th century 16.3 Crimean Tatar town dwellers at rest. A few individuals ventured into the wild fields on short-term expeditions to acquire the region's natural wealth. It was not long before the number of travelers to Ukraine's wilderness increased. This mode of existence farming, hunting, then returning home in the winter or perhaps remaining permanently came to be known as the Cossack way of life. In order to deal with the ever-present danger of Nogai slave raiders, the mostly Rus Ukrainian peasants and townspeople turned from 16.4 A Nogai Tatar mobile residents on the open T Zhir dwellers were by circumstance. Step. Forced to become skilled in the art of self-defense. With their new skills, some began to turn on the offensive, attacking Nogai slave raiding parties and Tatar trade caravans. It was not long before the frontier dwellers formed small armed bands to attack Ottoman commercial centers in the Crimea, Moldavia, and Wallachia. The very word Cossack, derived from the Turkish term Gazak, meaning freebooting warrior or raider, was first applied to Tatar renegades from the Crimean Khanate who were hired to fight for Muscovy and Lithuania. Despite its origins, the term Gazak slash Cossack was before long associated with those frontier dwellers, primarily Slavs but including all others who were opposed to the Tatar enemy. As early as the second half of the 15th century, Cossacks were being hired by Lithuanian officials from Ukraine's frontier palatinates and districts in order to help defend the Grand Duchy southern border. Because they were stationed in frontier settlements like Sherkazy, Chyhyryn, and Bratslay, these forces were known as Town Cossacks. For a while the group as a whole was called Sherkazy, after the fortified town along the Dnieper River south of Kiev, where they concentrated in largest numbers. The Town Cossacks, officially recognized because 16.5 Roxolana, 1505-1558, wife of the Ottoman Sultan Siyaliman Kenani, as depicted in a 17th-century engraving.
of their service to the Lithuanian and later Polish authorities, were in the course of the 16th century employed more and more frequently by powerful Rus magnates in Ukraine and by Poland's kings. Beginning in 1572, the king introduced the system of a register, whose roles began with 300 Cossacks. Subsequently the number of registered Cossacks, depending on political and military conditions in Poland-Lithuania, was to fluctuate during the first half of the 17th century from a high of 20,000 in 1620 to a low of 6,000 in 1638. In return for their services, the registered Cossacks, drawn primarily from well-to-do town Cossacks, were granted what later became known as traditional liberties. These included the right to own land and to pass it on to their offspring, exemption from taxes and from local Polish authorities, and effective self-government under a leader, Starshii, appointed by the government from among Cossack ranks. The registered Cossacks, officially known as the Army of Zaporozhia, even though they did not reside in Zaporozhia proper, were given the town of Traktimariv and its monastery as their permanent headquarters. In essence, the registered Cossacks became property holders with a vested interest in maintaining social stability within Poland-Lithuania. In contrast to the town and registered Cossacks were those Cossacks who lived farther south, away from Polish-Lithuanian authority and beyond the rapids located about halfway between the first and SEC. On Great Bends of the Dnieper River. It was from this geographic concept beyond the rapids, Ukrainian, Zaporohemy, that the regional name Zaporozhia and the group name Zaporozhian Cossacks derives. Zaporozhia became a haven for dissatisfied townspeople, for ever larger numbers of peasants wanting to flee the increasing burdens of Poland's monorail system and the reintroduction of serfdom, and for a host of other adventurers of various social backgrounds who simply wished to live beyond the reach of existing government control. In terms of 16.6 officers among the town, or regisi, tiered Cossacks, ethnicity, the vast majority were Slavs, in particular ancestors of modern-day Ukrainians, although there were also Romanian-slash-Moldavians, Tatars, Turks, and Jews who sought refuge in Zaporozhia. The center of Zaporozhian Cossack life was a fortified center known as the Sich, see Chapter 17. Despite their rejection of governmental authority and their scorn for town Cossacks who were formally registered the Zaporozhian Cossacks also served the Polish king from time to time, especially when he needed large numbers of troops to protect or extend the Commonwealth's frontiers. The Zaporozhians served as well under registered Cossack leaders, or hetmans, when they felt it was in their interests to do so. Like the Crimean Khanate, which had difficulty in controlling its Nogai Tatars, so too did Poland-Lithuania have little control over the actions of its Zaporozhian Kos. Sex. The Zaporozhians were particularly fond of carrying out sea raids against towns and landed estates in the Crimean Khanate and in Ottoman territories all along the shores of the Black Sea in some cases reaching as far as the outskirts of the latter's capital, Istanbul. These acts provoked reprisals on the part of the Ottoman authorities with the result that the first half of the 17th century witnessed a seemingly unbreakable cycle of actions and counteractions, the Zaporozhian Cossacks would raid the Crimea and Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans would retaliate with threats and at times would invade Poland-Lithuania, the Commonwealth's authorities would demand that the Zaporozhians cease their anti-Ottoman and anti-Crimean raids and would send punitive expeditions to intervene in Zaporozhian affairs, the Zaporozhians would rebel against this interference and often fierce battles with Polish armies would result in at the end nothing decisive ever occurred and the 16.7 a Zaporozhian Cossack in military or cycle would be repeated all over again. The repetitive cycle did, however, produce much bloodshed. This was particularly the case during two major Polish-Ottoman battles in Moldavia, at Tudorus slash in 1620, won by the Ottomans and Crimean Tatars, and at Koden in 1621, won by Poland-Lithuania with the aid of registered Zaporozhian Cossacks. As for the Polish-Zaporozhian clashes, these were most widespread during seven uprisings led by Krzysztof Kosinski KYI, 1591-1593, 
Severin Nalaveko and Rai Hori I Loboda, 1594-1596, Marcos Melo, 1625, Teres Fedorovic, 1630, Ivan Sulima, 1635, Pavlo Pavli Ukbut and Dimitro Hunia, 1637, and Lake of Ostrianin, 1638. Following the failure of the last of these revolts in 1638 the unregistered Cossacks of 4 FIMIPNEI Ren AC in Zaporozhia were all declared outlaws. 2 to S formally outlaws or not, Poland's military establishment almost without exception considered the Cossacks of Zaporozhia and their peasant followers to be social outcasts and dealt with them as such on the battlefield. Consequently, the treatment meted out by Poles to capture Zaporozhian 16.8 Zaporozhian Cossacks not only operated on land but also took to the sea, as depicted in this engraving, 1622, of their attacks against the Crimean port of Kiev slash A. Cossacks and by Cossacks to captured Poles, and in particular to their registered Cossack allies, was often brutal. In short, a deep-seated hatred and distrust developed on both sides between Zaporozhian Cossacks and Poles, something which was later depicted with great insight in the popular 19th century novel by Nikolai Gogol, Zara's Bulba. In the end, however, neither the registered Cossacks nor even unregistered Cossacks ever really questioned the premise that they were subjects of the Polish king. They simply wanted to be granted a special status within the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, whether recognition as a distinct social estate for the registered Cossacks or non-interference in Zaporozhia for the unregistered Cossacks. During the first half of the 17th century, the Cossacks took on an additional role. 16.9 Zaporozhian Cossack military camp during a land campaign. They came to be viewed and they viewed themselves as defenders of orthodoxy. In short, the Orthodox Rus with their Cossack defenders were pitted against Roman Catholic Poles and the Western-oriented Rus Uniats in a struggle that concerned not only social and administrative rights and privileges but also cultural values and, in this pre-national age, group identity. Crucial to this process was the activity of Petro Sahedeknyi, hetman of the Zaporozhian Cossacks and the hero in Poland's victory against the Ottoman Turks at the 1621 Battle of Koden. Taking advantage of his prestige in Polish society, Sahedeknyi pressed the Commonwealth to recognize the Orthodox hierarchy, secretly elected in 1620, and he enrolled all his Cossacks in the newly established Orthodox Kiev Brotherhood. For their part the church hierarchies recognized the historic mission of the Cossacks Nepal Tika A and considered the army of Zaporozhia, in K slash Nagatka Yen the words of Orthodox Metropolitan Love Boritz KYI, R. 1620 to 1631, as descendants of the glorious Rus, who more than any others in the whole world do so much for the benefit of persecuted and oppressed Orthodox Christians. Certainly, by the mid-17th century the Cossacks had become for the Rus, Ukrainian and Belarusian, populace of Poland-Lithuania the symbolic and real defenders of the Ortho. Doc's faith and identity. 16.10 Petro Konashevich Sahedeknyi, CA 1570-1622, hetman of the Zaporozhian Cossacks from 1614 until his death, as depicted in a contemporary engraving. Against the evildoers, man. Right. So our job is to come out and to rebuke it, man. All right, to pull our people out of the fire, to warn you, man. To blow up the trumpet that you're living in the last days, man. That fire is going to come and burn America off the face of the earth, man. Hashim and Mashiach get out shot, man. All right, and how is that going to happen? These things are going to happen through the awakening of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Right. This is the biggest fear of your enemies, man. White men in the nations, they are all confederate against you. Right. To keep you asleep. Okay, to keep you from knowing the truth, man. Alright, but the truth is out, man. Nothing can stop it. Read this. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 28 and verse 8. No. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war. So our job is to prophesy war, man. Alright, the Lord is raising us up in these last days, man, to prophesy our wars. Okay, so we talk about the wars that are coming, man. There's a war that is going to start that you're going to need a higher power to deliver you from. Right! It will be impossible for you to survive thermonuclear fire without the Most High God, man. Right! And His Son. And the Lord has set it up that way. That's why it's very important for you so-called blacks, Hispanics, and Americans. 
the lake of fire, man. Right. Ain't some people gonna starve out, man. Some people gonna get stabbed to death, man. Right. Right. Some people gonna watch their children die, man. Right. Right. Some people gonna eat their children, man. Right. And then they gonna get eaten, man. Right. right. Women are gonna be getting raped in the streets, man. Right. Your police force is going away, man. Right. Your stores right. are gonna be closed, man. Right. Who are you gonna call? Who's gonna save you there, man? It's not gonna be no more drugs, man. You won't have access to cigarettes, man.